Hello, guys, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Futurism at JHU podcast. Uh, and I'm here with Terry again one more time for yeah. uh, part two of our previous session, which was on AI. And, you know, last time we kind of ran out of time, ran out of space. Uh, a lot of pe other people were using, like, the room that we were going to be using. So we decided to just, like, cut it off, but then get some new ideas, get some fresh impressions, and then do a part two, especially because... A whole bunch of new things are coming out, especially with like Sora AI and the yeah. video uh, that involves. So we're going to be talking about that as well as just like general thoughts on more AI things, which include, you know, ethics, privacy issues, uh, data misuse, which has been pretty, pretty wild, um, as well as just like people generation. There's been a, I think it was like Google's AI, I don't exactly remember what it was called, but it recently like kind of got caught. Gemini? It might have been Gemini, but it, it got caught, like, if you told it to, like, oh, like, give me a picture of a scientist or an astronomer from, like, the 17th century, it just, like, would never give you a, an, a render of, like, a white person. It oh, was always, really? like, a certain type of person of color. And so people were, like, doing it. Somebody, like, told it to, like, give it a representation of, like, Elon Musk. Yeah. And it spit it out, Elon Musk, but, like, as a, as a black person. Oh. Which I think is pretty interesting. So we're going to be talking about, like, you know, general general stuff like that, uh, going more into into deep with that. Um, but, yeah, so starting off the conversation, what do you what do you want to start off with? Um, I think we should just kind of recap what we talked about last time. So last time we sort of talked about, like, um, this very ideal world, this ideal system that mm -hmm. would collect a lot of your pr personal data and then... Um, like these giant entities, like I don't know if they'll still be companies at that point. Okay. Basically, entities that would um, understand your personal lives and then um, suggest things that you should do or like could do. Uh, in that way, our lives are kind of already like designed in a way, uh -huh. and then our lives would be very like tuned to each person and their own personal preferences. Okay. Yeah, but it could also there's a lot of risk risk to it because um, you're, there's a lot of potential for like the people who are in charge to misuse that for their own personal gain. Yeah, yeah. especially like whoever creates this algorithm, because we, we've seen it with like a whole bunch of different things. Like if you, for example, like I was talking about, right, with the with the whole like uh, Gemini, Google AI photo creation, right? Yeah. Like they wanted to push a more, you know, encompassing, less just white people uh, perspective, which I think it's to yeah. a certain degree like fine, like you do want some type of diversity yeah. when you're coming up with like general terms, like, oh, give me a, pro a picture of a doctor, you know? Yeah. Because nowadays it's very normal to have a very diverse background when it comes to a lot of these different occupations. But if you're asking it like, oh, give me like an accurate representation of like a scientist or astronomer yeah. back in the 17th century, yeah. then contextually it doesn't really make sense to have all these people. Um, because oftentimes these people didn't necessarily were allowed to have the resources that yeah. like other people with more power had. So there's definitely that issue of like, we want to do good by it, but then sometimes even that can min misconstrue the way that the algorithm is interpreting things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that's that happens a lot, especially with like the YouTube algorithm. Like, what is it determined to be good? Yeah. And there's always people trying to like game the system, um, which is a pretty, you, you know, we can go into the whole idea of like min maxing for different algorithms and stuff, but it's you know it's definitely one of the things that we always have to be concerned about and especially with our usage of technology like not even just like ai but if we're talking about like instagram or pinterest or whatever other social media yeah. platform like you kind of have to recognize like how it's trying to feed you information because sometimes you know it keeps you in this like echo chamber of like oh i'm going to give you more things because you already like these things right and yeah. the more you feed it uh information the more it sort of spits back the the exact same information that you probably want to see which in some cases can be good right like if you're trying to learn about something like i don't know like uh mathematics and then it spits you more videos about mathematics so you can get really get into it yeah but if you start <laughs> watching like just brain rot video like things that aren't necessarily great for you yeah um then it's just going to perpetuate that even more and more but in in this case like what would you say if we had you know an ai that people were using for everyday decisions yeah um, what do you think would be potentially like, who do you think would have to have the reins of this sort of platform? Because, you know, some people may say, oh, a government should have this, but then, you know, governments have failed in the past, similar with like private companies, right? Yeah. Private companies, 
a lot of the times just are in it for the profit or just to yeah. make their shareholders happy. So like in this case, who do you think should have the reign of the power of such a an important <laughs> decision making like algorithm? Because it can be pretty scary when, you know, you're inciting action through the through the thoughts of this algorithm. Okay, so I think like my opinion on it is like so governments are basically a system where we agree to how like agree to a certain list of rules and that's how yeah. we're gonna run our society. And the mm -hmm. constitution is just like a boiled down version of that. Okay. So it represents like it's like, oh we're gonna like do X, follow Y and then not do Z. Yeah. And then it's like a lot of those. Uh, and we break them out beforehand and then we try to make sure the way we make our decisions is as closely linked to that as possible. Okay. Um so it's kind of like a mapping of what we believe the ideal world should be like to what like our, what the world actually is. Okay. So that's kind of saying, so I think your question, it kind of involves like what type of government is the most effective? I, I guess in a way, um, yeah, I mean, you could, you could like boil it down to that. I think there's also just the fact that like, you know, yeah, I, I guess you could do it because you could say technically say the same thing about like how governments should govern around like private companies, right? Because yeah. then they also have like, yeah, a certain things that they are allowed to do because the government allows them to. Yeah. So, so like, um, so w as of what I know about governments, like based on my current knowledge, like I don't really like research this thing, but based on, based on what I know is like, uh, there are different types of government, like direct democracy, like yeah. everybody just votes something and then they decide on everything like directly. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's like indirect democracy where we vote on the people who decide on that. So yeah. We're, so the representatives. US is, yeah. yeah. The U S is that. Yeah. Uh, because we vote on like the house of representatives the people in the senate yeah um and indeed the side things yeah um well actually no we vote on the people in the house of representatives and in the senate it's like electoral college is a totally different set of things yeah it's yeah, a, it's, yeah. it's it's quite a bit different i'm not yeah. i don't exactly remember how it works so it's like we vote yeah. for people that decide things for us but direct democracy is we decide things ourselves yeah i think yeah, yeah. i think if you were to name it i think the u.s is called like a a democratic republic yeah, yeah because yeah. we have like the republic part of it is we have democracy because we're able to choose but the republic means that like we choose representatives because we don't want to deal with the hassle of voting everyone on every yeah, single yeah. tiny little issue that like the country wants to have on like yeah wants to solve yeah i mean it's like because um there used to be like monarchies right there would be like this one king and then everybody um there are like arg arguments in the past uh, especially like by Hobbes, like politicians, like like people like like philosophers and people like Hobbes, yeah, who argue that like there's he argues for absolute monarchy where there's a king at the top, and everybody at the bottom gives up their all, all their rights, yeah, um, and they just like give it to the king to decide everything. Mm -hmm. um, so like, but like okay, they, based on things that happen in history, like the king is not perfect; he's just a human too. Yeah. So like he could make some mistakes and then there will be a lot of consequences for the people. Yeah. And they kind of can't do anything about it. Okay. But then what if you, but okay. But then he also said, what if you had like a group of people, like an assembly of men? Okay. So instead of like one person, you have like a group of people and it's like less prone to errors. Uh, I guess that would be the exact same thing as like the house of representatives that we have. Okay. But that is, we choose the people in power. Yeah. This is like, they're not chosen. It's like, um, it's like, uh, inherited. It could be like inherited. So but, inherited power? Yeah, inherited these power, people? yeah. Well, at that point, um, you go into the issue of, like, um, nepotism, right? It's like, oh, my child, like, yeah. I'm, I'm in power. I'm yeah. one of the, these people that hold a lot of power. Yeah. Um, I want my child to have, like, a, a successful life. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is, I know he's not the brightest. I know he's probably not the most morally correct person. Yeah. And, but, you know, I want him to have, like, the best life possible. Yeah. So when I go, I'm going to give that power over to him so that he can, you know, have the best life that he can. Yeah, so... Um... So I think that's, like, that's what a lot of problem that comes with nepotism. Some of it, there have been successful cases of it where, like, yeah. you sort of shape the person to be able to fit the role of whatever. You can kind of think of this as, like, you know, uh, sons or daughters of you know, successful company owners and these kids from a very young age have been taught to like, okay, this is how 
you know, once this whole thing happens, you're going to take reign over yeah. like, the company so that you can perform the duties that you're supposed to do yeah. in like the most correct way. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the times we also see like the negative impacts of that, which is these people are kind of left with power where they don't know what to do with it and they aren't necessarily taught to handle the power either way. Yeah. So one of two things happens, either they give the power to someone else or potentially like the, the company just kind of comes to a crumble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- I think that's the biggest reason why we don't necessarily see that type of like structure and power. Because um, if, if you were to just give it to someone just because you wanted to, like if it's just one direct line, that's where it kind of fails. If you had like, again, with like the representatives, right, you get at the very least a more accurate representation of the, the things that people want. Yeah. But even then, like people are very easy to dissuade. Mm-hmm. right so if you wanted to you can go to like a rural town in the u.s yeah and sort of like fill fill them with hopes and dreams so that they vote for you yeah even if you may not necessarily have the best interest in mind and that yeah. does sometimes does do happen yeah right there there's corrupt politicians like everywhere not just in the u.s there, there was a funny meme of like this i don't exactly remember where it happened but it was in this country where this this woman was trying to run um uh, as an like an elected official and then she gave a, 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 a auto bus yeah. to like a village. Yeah. And they didn't end up voting for her. She took the bus back. Yeah. <laughs> shamelessly. Yeah. So I think there there's there's definitely like that, but I again like these are all just like pros and cons to like various different methodologies. And even the thing that we have in the US, I wouldn't necessarily say it's like the best. Yeah. Right? Because there's there's still a whole bunch of problem stuff with it. So in that sense, I don't really know. Like what would you say would be like one of the the ways to get past that like government structure um so the way i see it is like you need a sort of way to evaluate people Mm -hmm. and their potential and you need that to be very accurate and reflecting what they can do and like will probably do Mm -hmm. in order to like put them in their specific roles right okay so like we achieved that in the past by like one See, saying, oh, he was the king of a successful person. I mean, he yeah. was the son of a successful person. Yeah. So um, he was likely to be successful because you passed on our genes. Or you say uh, he had evidence of being successful because yeah, he, yeah. F- during this time of period, like during his childhood, he like published a book, <laughs> did these things that so sort of are signs of like, of, like a, a meritocracy. If you a will. meritocracy. Like they're signs, they're evidence of his potential and like what he can do and will probably do. Mm-hmm. Um, but then that's still like, it's better evidence than just like basing it off of like, like who you are ch- the child of, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then what? But then that's still like limited. That's still not like perfect. Uh, in yeah, a way. because people lose lose it. Like I've seen it happen as well. Like people yeah. lose interest or something in their life happened, and then like you know the potential that they might have had like just never gets cultured. Yeah. So in that sense, like it, I'm not gonna say like necessarily wasted potential, but it's not the trajectory with which people are seeing that person in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it definitely does happen where like it's it's not it's definitely not a straight path. Yeah. So imagine. So the question I'm asking is, do you think it's possible if this like nearly perfect godlike AI will be able to predict each person's potential and capabilities? Oh, that's a that's an based on at the moment they were born. Uh, theoretically, I guess you could. Okay, th- I think the biggest thing that we kind of go back to is like simulation, right? If you yeah. were able to simulate conditions perfectly then maybe perhaps right because then you could i don't know take a person's dna because dna is basically just like the building blocks for that person and how it'll develop over time yeah uh of course there's still like some environmental factors which you have to account for if for example somebody one of the things that i'm thinking of is like height for example right yeah you can have the exact same genes yeah but if you live in an environment where you have the proper nutrition yeah yeah, you're gonna grow taller than if like somebody who did it? Who didn't have that proper nutrition? Yeah, exactly. Even if they're the exact same genes, even like the, if they're twins. So, if you know, and then again, you would need like incredible power for you to be able to do this. Exactly. Uh, but assuming that you have like you know near infinite power, like the power of the sun and super fast computing, then if you were able to like theoretically take these genes, you can in a way like carve out a path where you kind of know where to direct this person so that they reach their ultimate potential. So theoretically, yeah. it, it can happen. Uh, there's been a lot of, like, different medium media about this. Like, anime has done this a lot with, like, a couple of different yeah. uh, themes around it. One of yeah. the anime is, like, Psychopaths, where instead yeah. of, like, predicting somebody's, like, you know, how they should go about their life to 
reach their utmost potential, they have this algorithm that is able to detect who's going to do a crime when. Uh-huh. And so they like, I don't remember if at the time of the, the crime happens, like they arrest the person or even before the crime happens. Yeah. They arrest the person because they know that, you know, this person's going to be like a serial killer or, yeah. or, or something like that. Um, so I think, again, like this could 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 potentially like be a possibility. Um, but I think we also have to like think about how people could potentially like if something like this were implemented today. Yeah. How do you think people would potentially like react to the idea of like, hey, we have this AI yeah, I know, that exactly. will choose like your actions and what you should do for your like your best interests in mind. I don't necessarily think a lot of people would take it kindly. Maybe there's going to be like some front runners that would say, hey, yeah, I'll like try it out and see if my like life improves in like a week of using this this potential product. Um, I don't think it's about I don't think it's like the AI telling you what to do. Okay. It's more of just like um, t- like suggesting things. Okay. So like it's kind of like giving you endless op- options, oh, and it okay. it, would, it would recommend certain things, and it's your choice ultimately. Okay. Yeah. So in that sense, I get in that sense, I guess it would just simply be like a suggestion, but like or not even a suggestion. It would just be like, oh, here's another thing you could do, and if you choose that, you find that's really good, and you're like, oh, maybe it's, this AI is pretty good. And then next time oh, it's like okay, okay. this thing is they say it's like good at right again, so they'll you keep choosing it or something. So like it's it's basically like a real time suggestion algorithm. Yeah, like you like a YouTube algorithm for life. Interesting. I guess how encompassing or how like powerful should the like I, I'm like if you were to envision this, would you make it so that like this particular algorithm chooses things that are like super important, or would you like Make it so that it's like choosing things that don't really have that much important importance at first. What do you mean by important? So, like for example, choosing a career uh, is yeah. potentially way more impactful to like a person's life uh-huh. than choosing like the strawberry muffin versus like the blueberry muffin, right? Oh, okay. So, like, to what extent would you, you know, make this algorithm give suggestions? Like, would you say, oh, these things are like like to what level of granularity? Yeah, because then you know, <laughs> if it's suggesting you things all over, like, oh, you should move your hand like thirty degrees to the right, or then, and then like you know, you should move your hands in a certain angle. Yeah. Right. Then maybe maybe it's not as worth it because like the 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 things that you're getting back are really not that much more important versus like oh maybe you should choose like mechanical engineering over chemical engineering or maybe you should i don't know you should buy like a hybrid car versus like a, a diesel like truck. you should live in new york then live in utah yeah like know. these are these are varying levels of like how much this can potentially impact the life of a person yeah. versus no offense oh, to utah yeah no utah <laughs> yeah um but yeah so but like that's one of the things right like uh, there, there's got to be a balance between like overwhelming your user with like options yeah and like so m- maybe like overpowering or like choosing things that can very easily just like change someone's trajectory too much yeah so i think the concept here is like the limitation of so what we conceive of as a suggestion or like giving uh-huh. an option is that we like click on it or like we choose it right yeah so we, we go we, with you it you give ourselves some time to think about it okay but let's say there isn't that kind of like time delay okay let's say we just like become the ai okay to the point so like so imagine like um you're watching a video, like watching videos on YouTube. There's like four videos. You see this, you like think for three seconds, re- uh, look at that other one for three seconds, and then you uh-huh. choose it. Um, there's a time delay of three seconds. Yeah. But let's say when it suggests that like you move your hand thirty degrees to the right, instead of thinking, oh, should I move my hand thirty degrees to the right for three seconds, you just do it. Okay. So it's like instantaneous. I guess in that sense, it's more akin to like. Um to like instinct yeah. based or like refle- yeah. or yeah. reflections. Um, what is it called? Like your reaction time. Yeah. And then, so like, if you think about that, like move your hand 30, sec- 30 degrees to the right, that might be very pivotal in like a martial arts like in context. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like you're fighting a, like a guy with a knife, you move your hand to the right, you block the knife. Yeah. Or something like crazy like that, you know? Interesting. Yeah. So I guess in that sense, it would, it would work sort of like a, a second brain that like at that point, over. are you still even you? Are, are you the AI? Probably like, not. Yeah, you're probably just the machine. Yeah, you're probably just like a. That just makes me think of like you being a. A meat suit that like an yeah. AI is controlling. Like at that point, you're just giving autonomy to the AI no, I to think, be able I to. I don't like, think the interact. AI is controlling you. It's more like we merge together. But then, so then, are you still able to like, even if it says 
for example, it tells you or it signals you to move 30 degrees to the right. Yeah. You can still say no, or do you like confer with the AI to know what to think? Like, it's almost like two heads thinking at the same time, right? Yeah. And if they have like a differing opinion, there has to be some way of like either merging the two ideas together or like one wins over the other. It's kind of like an argument when yeah, people yeah, yeah, have, yeah. right? Like either one of them ends up winning or none of them end up winning and so nothing happens or maybe there's like a merging of ideas and so, something new comes um, out of it. I don't know like the science behind this, but have you read like Thinking Fast and Slow? No. So, okay, it's basically a book where it says there are like two modes of thinking. One is like you sit down and de- deliberately think about how to do this complex math problem yeah. and you solve it. Uh-huh. Other Other way of thinking is like, you're walking, you move my right foot, you don't think about it consciously. It's like it's very instinctual. instinctual. Yeah. It's still thinking at that point. It's, Technically, making, it's yeah. still making a decision, but it's yeah. a different kind of decision. Yeah. So it's like, um, it's still you deciding to move forward with your right leg. Yeah. Like that, that goes down to like defining what is you, like what is I, you know? Oh, okay. So like a deeper, like subconscious yeah. idea. Okay. I can kind I can kind of see that. Um, because because it, it does make sense like if you if you breathe, you can think of breathing and then you can like stop your breathing or you oh, can yeah. breathe like yeah. um, heavier or faster, but there is this you know your body will just like keep you alive. However, I don't know if I'd necessarily like consider it thinking thinking like I would say it's just like body responses. Yeah. Right. Because for example, somebody can be in a vegetative state. Yeah. Like they can be technically brain dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But their organs will still keep beating. Yeah. Right. Like the brain will still send some semblance of signals to keep the body going yeah so okay so like i do know it's because i'm a neuro major nice the limbic system controls the like like the breathing uh-huh. the, the subconscious stuff like the heart rate etc yeah and then the prefrontal cortex is, is linked with the more complex decision making like okay. deciding what major to choose deciding a future partner deciding a job whatever uh-huh. um like solving a chess pro- puzzle okay like it's it's different parts of your brain, but they're still you. Yeah. So, um, but what if the limbic system, like, what if they, like, come together in a way? Oh, so, like, the limbic system and, like, in which part, like, your, or, like, an AI system coming together with the limbic system? Yeah, no, okay, okay, so sense. Elon Musk said something. He was, like, there, he categorized it with three systems. I don't okay. know if I agree with it. Okay. So he was like, the limbic system is the base. It's like lizard brain. Yeah, yeah. It's just like survival stuff. Yeah. Second system is like our consciousness currently. It's like, I'm aware I am here. You're, I'm aware you're here. Yeah. Um, I can decide to like buy lunch later or something. It's like deeper thought. Deeper thought. Will. And the third layer is the technology layer. So right now we have a technology layer. It's like we interact with our phones and computers. Yeah. He says that we have very low bandwidth because we're just like typing with our fingers. Okay. As opposed to like having a neural chip in our brain. Oh, okay. That's why he wants to have Neuralink. Um, like, so we can increase the rate at which we can communicate with technology. Um, so in a way, when you do that, like, does the computer become a part of you? Is the trip a part of you? I feel like the way that he's probably, like, communicating the idea. Yeah. It's not so much that, like, you're becoming a part of the computer or, becoming, or a computer is becoming a part of you. But it's just, I think, the rate at which you're able to consume stuff, right? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I feel like for us... You know, it takes us, for example, an hour yeah. to watch, like, an hour-long YouTube video. You, yeah. If some people are able to, like, speed it up to one and a half times speed yeah. to where they can consume it faster, but maybe there's a loss. It's it's a lossy transfer, right? Because you're not getting the information at a speed with which you can process things. Yeah. So it becomes harder. Yeah. Uh, and I think the way that he's sort of potentially envisioning that idea is us just being able to compute or make connections faster through the integration of a chip, either sending the information yeah. from a computer to the chip and then speeding up the rate of like conversion to thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that's the only way. Cause like at that point, like the computer isn't necessarily you, you're just gathering information. That would be like having somebody that reads really fast the, you know, there's some people that train their whole lives to be able to open up a book and simply flip through it. And like understand and remember, remember and like recall everything yeah, that was yeah, in the book. Yeah. So like there, there is a an increased um, transfer speed between like the words that are on the book yeah. and then them getting to your brain. Yeah, I know. Um, but the book isn't you. Like it's just something that you remember. 
I guess in a way it does become a part of you because then you 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 have it stored in your brain. Yeah. But it's not like that's necessarily like affecting or impacting the way that you do things. You still have to take a conscious decision of like using and employing the information that you got from a book. It's the same reason why like you can technically read a book and not get anything from it if you're not critically thinking of the things the book is saying. Right. The whole the whole idea of um of like literacy skills is not just reading but understanding what you're reading. Um I think that's okay so what you're saying is like the book a physical book is not you because it's like just literally a book, right? Yeah. But if we think of the book as not a, just like a like a physical bundle of paper pages, uh-huh. but rather the information within it. Yeah. And we say that we intake that information and then we cohesively us, like connect that information with our previous base of knowledge okay that becomes you yeah that and that's yeah that's what i would like um describe as like the processing part yeah yeah. because yeah. it would be for example if, if you take it back to like computer terms it would be like me having a, a hard drive yeah with uh like a certain data set and then i'm transferring that data set from the hard drive to my computer yeah so that it's on my computer um hard drive but i haven't done anything with it yet yeah. like it's still not useful it's still not being currently employed yeah I have to get it to process somehow so that my computer is able to utilize that information to do something with it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's like that processing layer and that's when it's, it really becomes a part of you, right? Because now you're able to employ it. Now you're able to use a lot of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas before it's just a file. It's just a thing. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily change the way of life. Like I said, like you can take, for example, a book that you're reading. If you're not critically thinking of the book as you're reading it, yeah. you're not getting anything from it. It's just a book that you read. But it's not mm-hmm. a part of you because the things that the book is trying to teach you, uh, the language in which it's speaking, the author's experiences, like all this which is ingrained within the book, you're not um, contextualizing it. You're not processing it. Yeah, I know. So there's like that that layer, which I think is what Elon Musk was talking about, like you still have to think about it, but just like you don't have to wait for you to, you don't have to wait for the buffering time of just like getting the file transfer. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. If the file transfer is instantaneous. You're increasing the file transfer rate. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you can only, wor- then you only have to worry about the processing aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's what he was getting at. Um, and then, you know, speeding yeah. up the processing, like I think that's a whole other thing which can potentially also be done through like, computer brain computer interfaces like there might uh, maybe maybe not this instant but there might be the possibility increasing of like, iq of increasing iq or yeah. potentially like you know increasing the rate at which we process very simple tasks even if it's just like you know elementary grade math yeah right but not having to rely on an external thing to do it would certainly speed up like mathematicians writing out yeah. equations on the board yeah like there's been many times where i've been in like a, a math class here on campus and the professor's as they're writing problems on the board, they mess up on like very elementary math. Oh yeah. Because they're thinking of other things, right? Yeah. If they don't have to worry about that anymore, then it speeds up the process yeah. at which they're doing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there could be benefits, but I think it's definitely like more of a the transfer rate rather than the processing rate that he's talking about in that sense. Um. Yeah. So I just want to say, okay, I want to say like two things. So one thing, first thing, um, one good example of like the increasing file transfer rate idea is like. Like, imagine Stephen Hawking, like, uh-huh. a brilliant mind. He, like, thinks really fast, you know, all those physics yeah, equations yeah. in his head. But he has to move, like, this cursor with his eye. Yeah, exactly. And it's, like, one one letter at a time. Yeah, yeah So exactly. imagine him writing a book with that. It's, like, like the bit of transfer rate is so slow. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, Elon Musk's model was, like, we're trying to create a company where, like, Stephen Hawking could communicate with people faster than, like, a speed typewriter or, like, the fastest speaker in the world. Yeah, and yeah. and that's where like the potential of like and again a lot of media forums have done this, but like you come to the idea of potentially brain to brain communication. Yeah, where it's not necessarily that you're like sharing and like becoming a part of somebody else's consciousness. That's not necessarily what it is, but rather you're able to communicate ideas way faster, right? Yeah. Instead of me saying, "Hello, how are you?" and maybe that takes <laughs> three or four seconds, you can do it in like one millisecond. Yeah. And then, you know, you can respond back and forth. So now, instead of having a conversation that maybe took us, like, an hour to get to, yeah. we can do it in, like, five minutes. Yeah. Right? So, and, and it's definitely helpful. Like, uh, brain-computer interfaces have been used, or that that's, like, the main purpose, especially if you're doing a lot of research on brain-computer interfaces. Like, 
uh, APL here at J2 has a lot of brain computer interfaces that they've been working with to try and get people with like locked in syndrome yeah. to be able to communicate and to be able to have like this physical aspect with the outside world again, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to do anything. There is no transfer yeah. to the yeah. outside world. Yeah. So increasing these capabilities is useful, not only for them, but maybe potentially in the future, like for us, yeah. right? Because now instead of having to sit through like a lecture for an hour straight, maybe lectures now become like 20 minutes long where mm-hmm. the professor's quickly able to like uh, give to us like mental images of what <laughs> he wants to like teach yeah, us. Yeah. And then we can similarly ask questions and give him like a very great way of visualizing what we don't understand. Yeah. yeah. So not only does it increase transfer rate, but it also increases like data quality. Yeah. Right? So, Cause sometimes for example, and, and this happens to like a lot of artists, like you have an idea in your head, yeah. maybe if you're trying to draw, but maybe you don't have the capabilities of drawing. Yeah. And so there's like a disconnect between what the picture that you have in your head and the thing that you're trying to draw. Yeah. So maybe what if you could like, you know, send that idea as exactly as you see it to like somebody that can draw or a system that can draw. Yeah. And so now you eliminate the barrier of having you yourself to learn these very specific skills for only one purpose. And maybe that's where like something like um, AI, you know, drawing or, you know, photo formation happens. But maybe if if instead of a prompt, maybe it was something along the lines of like a thought that you send over to like a system and then it's able to create or give a perfect representation of what you were thinking. Yeah. Then it, that's really helpful, right? Because then now you don't necessarily have to learn the skills, but it's still your own thoughts yeah. that are shaping like the art that a system can create. So I think what's really interesting is like what you're saying is like we're limited by like our brains and cap- full cognitive potential is limited by um, like the physical nature in which we like the physical body we live in. Yeah, um, totally. Let's say we solve that. Oh, the solving the... Let's say, assume we solve that, our brains are the same, but we are able to, like, share thoughts instantly. Like, I'm able to share what I'm thinking instantly with you, like, everything I'm thinking, and right. you share everything you're thinking with me instantly. Um, I'm able to, like, put everything I'm imagining onto a sheet of paper or something, uh-huh. and onto a computer instantly. The computer's able to put everything it's, like, has into my brain instantly. What would the limiting factor then be? It would be the cognitive processing fat, like, speed yeah, of the brain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. how fast you think and yeah. how how complex you can think, yeah. right? And, Which are two different and things. And I guess my question is, that would, that would just be considered intelligence, no? Ye- yes. yes. I think so. And I guess the big million dollar question is, how would you increase that? How do you increase intelligence? Yeah. That's a really interesting point. Um, see, uh, I feel like I'm probably not like the best person to ask this. Because I, I, some people have, like, very different ways of thinking about, like, intellect. There's been a lot of people, like, for example, the the person who originally wrote, like, the SAT, for example. Like, yeah. his thought on, on intelligence was that, like, it was similar to IQ, something that you, like, are innate, and it doesn't really grow. But we know that um, nowadays, like, if you take an IQ test, you can become good at taking IQ tests. Yeah. And you can artificially increase your IQ. Uh, similarly, you might, you know you might think that some professors are very like talented in whatever field they're maybe yeah. they're in physics or um, mathematics or whatever it might yeah. be but you also have you you at the same time you kind of dis- disregard like the amount of time that it took them to get there yeah so i wouldn't necessarily know cuz there is definitely some innateness to like people or some people just find it easier to solve complex problems or yeah. you know they have this certain ability but then sometimes it's just they've done something so many times. Yeah. It's become so repetitive yeah. that they have built these like brain banks that they're able to go back to yeah. to make the processing yeah. a lot faster. So even then, like I'm not exactly sure if intelligence is really something that's like set in stone or if we just need to increase the speed at which we progress our Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like um like what we were talking about earlier, like imagine the AI analyzes your gene uh-huh. and it predicts your potential and your cap- like, like um, ability later on to uh-huh. grow. Like it would, I feel like we, the full potential of a human being is actually way more than like what we live to now. It probably is, yeah. Yeah, because, um, right, I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to say like, like imagine, so you can say like a human has fixed intelligence. 
Right. Uh, but then if they truly believe in that, they just wouldn't try. That's true. Right? Yeah, yes. It's yes, like yes. growth mindset and fixed mindset. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. They, if they have a growth mindset, they would try more and yeah. they would like become smarter because yeah. they would have the opportunity to make mistakes and learn from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So That's it's really like true. the way we define intelligence is it's so unwell defined. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like that. Like it's like, uh, it's like, is it like your the stuff you know or like your ability or like your gene? I don't know, like fucking combination. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but like intelligence really is really it's a really hard t- thing to talk about. I feel like especially in our modern world, because like you can say, oh, that guy's really smart, therefore he got into Harvard. Yeah, and chalk it up to that, and then and you say because I'm less smart, I won't get in, or because I didn't get in, I'm less smart. That's yeah. such a bad way to think about it. Yeah, because you definitely. have you are so many, you are made up of so many more qualities than just your IQ, your just yeah, your exactly. intelligence. Um, and it's like if you are able to change that, it opens up the world to be like so much more. There'll be so much more differentiation between people. Yeah. So, so much more hierarchy because the world is already highly like uh, strat- stratified based on like the wealth of like yeah. upper classes like the w- world richest 10% is like 50% of the whole world's wealth or something crazy yeah which is insane um, and it like the stratification is crazy but then if you were to argue like the poorest person is is not like worth any less than like the richest person they're yeah. still the same people yeah. just like maybe their abilities are like different you know yeah exactly and yeah. you really see that specifically I think it's very easy to come up on this like thought that like I don't know intelligence is innate to a person and yeah. it can never really change, especially when you're in a very like academic setting because yeah. it sort of feels like that way. Like you just feel like some people are really smart and then some people really aren't. But I think at least for me, one of the ways that you can really tell that even regardless of how smart or someone you may perceive to be is, yeah, like their abilities are way different is when you get into like any sort of sporting event, right? Yeah, because these people like some people are born with like what you would think are like really weird body shapes. Yeah. But that like increases their ability or their output in like a specific um, competition. So for example, like I do a lot of lifting. And so one of the things that a lot of people do is like deadlifting, for example. Yeah. Right? It's one of those like core exercises that a lot of people do. Well, if you are a person that has longer arms than usual, uh, a lot of the time, if yeah. you, you will have a, an easier time deadlifting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's versus, like the biology is just there for you. The, the biology is helping you, exactly. Yeah. Versus like if you if you have to bench press or yeah. if you have longer arms. It's you literally you have better out. like, you have better angle for it. You, you have know? a better angle. Um, uh, higher torque. Higher, yeah, exactly. <laughs> torque capacity. So, and even then, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you as a person that doesn't isn't born with these things can't necessarily surpass a person that has these yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. Because at the end of the day, it all depends on how you progress. Yeah. Um, another great analogy is if, you know, if you're walking so much, um, you know, a person that likes walking is going to get further than a person who just wants to get somewhere. Yeah. Um, which means, like, you just kind of have to be consistent. And the truest thing of it all, especially if you look into bodybuilding, there's been a lot of people that are like, oh, like, fake naturals or whatever. Like, a lot yeah. of people taking gear um, yeah. and then saying that they're natural. But then even if you want to, like, only look at natural um, athletes, you don't necessarily know their gene makeup. Yeah. So, and even yourself, like, you don't really know how far you can get unless you get there. Yeah. So, there, uh, to, to a degree, like, if you're thinking that, you know, I'm never smart enough or I can never get anywhere. Yeah. Um, obviously, there are things that are going to help. There's things that, that are not going to help. But you never know if you're going to get somewhere unless you try to get there. Um, because again, like a lot of people oftentimes say, oh, I don't have the best genes for like working out or I thought I didn't have the best genes working out. Yeah. Maybe I was too skinny. Maybe I was too fat, maybe too like tall, maybe too short. Um, but then you slowly make your progress and then you end up like 20 miles away from where you originally yeah. started. Yeah. So I think definitely like knowing the potential that you have, especially as someone that like may not necessarily know can be a huge like boost in help yeah right even if for example like we had an algorithm that was able to analyze your dna and say hey you have like out of a hundred points you have like a 98 percent of being able to re- like reach your goals or yeah. reach whatever yeah. like thing that you want to do uh, i feel like that can be really useful for people yeah. because then they're able to like know that they have that potential in them yeah they just have to get there i guess yeah um 
So you said, um, like before, when you're talking about the weightlifting thing, right? You said yeah. like deadlift, some people's arms are longer, so they deadlift easier. They have higher deadlift PRs than like bench PRs. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a very similar thing to that is like body types, like ectomorph, mesomorph, and some other morph. Yeah. Uh, like if you're one of them, if you're one type of morph, you're more prone to building muscle. Yeah. But it's just like you have more fat, fat like slow twitch, like fast switch fibers. Yeah, we have more higher percentage of fast switch fibers and that grows bigger. It literally yeah. just grows bigger than slow twitch fibers. So like there's fast twitch, slow twitch, and a hybrid, and a hybrid like can convert between slow and fast twitch. Yeah. So that's why most bodybuilders are like if they're like genetic freaks, they just like have a lot of fast twitch fibers and nearly yeah, exactly. them. So it's like that's why if you have like a long distance runner who's really good at long distance, you try to get him to become like a jack bodybuilder, like he just it's like very hard for him to like build that same amount of muscle. Yeah. Yeah. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that he can't be very good at it. It yeah. just means that it's going to take him longer yeah, yeah, yeah. to do it. But yeah, no, like genetics, especially in like a lot of sporting events, definitely like have a lot to do. And that's why at some point, like, you know, some people may in fact be natural when you think they're like taking gear or taking like anabolic steroids or whatever you want. Yeah. Because their physiology is just so different. Yeah. Right. We see this in in, in animals too. I don't exact, exactly remember what protein it is. Yeah. But some animals have, I think, too little of this protein, and this protein makes it so that uh, the less of this protein you have, the more muscular you become. So there are, like, some species of, like, cows that just happen oh, to have yeah, this genetic I saw thing. It. Yeah, I saw those. That are just, yeah. like, absolutely ripped. <laughs> and that, that, that happens to humans as well. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not uh, no, it's just... it's so funny. Yeah, it's not just animals. So. No, but it's, like, painful. It's like, why the fuck do you need that muscle? Like, <laughs> Yeah, no, and that's the thing, right? In the yeah. wild, in the wild, because... Um, and, and this is another reason why, like, bodybuilding, and if you get into the whole, like, body physiology stuff, is really interesting. Like, it's not very advantageous for your body to have muscle because muscle burns more calories than, yeah. like, just fat or, like, yeah. just generally other things. So if you're out in the wild and trying to survive, why would you want a ration of food to last you less time yeah. than... You know, then if you didn't have as much muscle, right? Yeah, it's so your like, body is like, it's like doesn't want. Why it. do you need to lift like a like a like one hundred kg stone? Yeah, but it costs like two twenty times more energy to like maintain that keep level capable. You just never need it. It's so niche. It's just exactly like, yeah. like if you're using it 0.1 percent of the time, your body's like it's not efficient for us yeah. to keep wasting and burning yeah. these amount of calories unnecessarily. Yeah, like you're just wasting food at that point. So your body is very good at like saying, oh, we're not using this muscle. Let's just like put it off yeah exactly so that's why like if you ever want to do bodybuilding or stuff like that like you really got to be consistent because you got to tell your body hey i'm like constantly using this muscle or maybe i'm constantly like tearing muscles and you need to build them back up yeah kind of thing obviously like don't overtrain. there's you can also do that and then you can kind of become sick uh, but there, there's definitely a balance of like telling your body giving your body enough stimulus to be able to do these things and it will adapt because it has to similar similarly with like intelligence they like, were talking yeah. about right like if you get used to having to do math problems or this specific type of math problem every other day, every other day, every other day, you as a person, your mind is going to develop these shortcuts. Yeah. Right. And you're going to start to see patterns that will yeah. help you get things done faster. Yeah. And that also gives the perception of someone being, you know, smarter. It may not necessarily be that they're smarter, but they've seen the same thing enough times to where they were able to find shortcuts or they were yeah. able to find patterns within the things that they were yeah. doing that yeah. speeds up their process. So they th they are able to think about things in a different way than you are, which again, doesn't necessarily mean that they are smarter. They just had more time to develop these skills. And I think that's, to a great degree, that's what it's all about. But again, what if we could have an AI algorithm, even if it doesn't necessarily control us, but at the very least, it was able to give us a, a, a plan, like a mental plan, yeah. something that was able to train our minds to think more optimally, right? Like, yeah. I think, I think that would be really cool because there's already like platforms out there. There's Khan Academy that tried implementing like an AI thing. Yeah. There's a lot of other like platforms, but what if we could like genetically analyze our DNA and then know the strategies that help us grow the best? I think to me, that's, that's, even if it's not like super suggesting things to do as the original algorithm that we pose, yeah. it can still be really helpful in saying, yeah. if you have this goal based on your genetic makeup, this is how we think, or this is how the algorithm thinks you'll be able to attain that goal faster due to like your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, another crazy example I, I thought of was, it's like, 
like chess grandmasters. Oh, chess okay. players. Okay, yeah. so imagine you're a baby, like baby Hikaru, you know, Hikaru Nakamura. Mm-hmm. Um, you pop out of the womb. You're not going to be able to calculate this incredibly, like, complicated endgame position, like, 30 moves ahead. You just yeah, can't. Exactly. It's just, like, not feasible for a baby. So yeah. how did he go from that to, like, where he is now? Mm-hmm. Just training. Exactly. So, like, you can say that he has, like, he's really smart because he able to calculate all that. But it's, like, through intense training and repetition, he was able to develop that. So the question is, like, what about the training? Like, how does it change your brain such that you are able to hold so many positions in your head and memorize it all? Because, like, yeah. some grandmasters, they, they see a game, they remember, like, 10, 10 years later. It's crazy. Yeah. It's like, how do you develop that? It's just, like, the pattern recognition is so strong in your brain. Yeah. Yeah, the connections are so strong. And, sim- and, and it's very similar to what I said about, like, some people training to just be able to, like, automatically just open a book and then, like, have photographic memory. Yeah. Whether you think it's fake or not, there are people out there who are able to train yeah. their memory such that they have photographic memory like abilities. Yeah, it's like um it's which like, a lot of people think are just like gifts that you Yeah, exactly. Memorize. It's like super memory. It's like memory palace. It's like you know super memory it's like look through a flip of, like a deck of cards, they can re- recreate it from scratch. Oh really? It's insane. Like they can memorize like ten thousand words uh, in perfect order. Yeah. It's crazy. It's like how do you do that? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And it's just, but again, it's like a super specific thing that you yeah. have to train for, right? Yeah. I think everybody can potentially get to that point. There's going to be people that do it faster. Maybe they yeah. take them like two years to do it. There's going to be people that it takes like yeah. 10 years to do yeah. it. But I feel like everybody has the potential to reach very high levels of feats that we don't think we can. Yeah. So I think what we established based on these examples is that we all have within us very high potentials. Like, yeah. right? Our ceiling is very high. We don't even know what the ceiling is. Yeah. Um, so the question is, why are we unable to attain that? Mm. Or like, why are the, most of us not able to attain that? And I think it comes down to the fact that it's like the muscle analogy. It's like, we don't need to. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like um, even if you wanted to, if you think it would be nice, you can't just be like, oh, I want it, so I'll become that. You have to like put in the effort and inten- intentionally do it for like 10 years straight. And it's painful. It's painful. It's yeah. like very discomforting. So it's like the... I guess it's just like the nature of humans where we are, we want to be in a state of like expending the least amount of energy. Yeah. Um, so like, like imagine running a marathon. It's like nobody runs a marathon for fun. Unless actually some people do. But. Some people do. But I think, I think that's really interesting, right? I think the idea is that like we end up liking something and that's that liking is more powerful than our dislike or, or like the discomfort that it brings. Yeah, yeah. So for example, right, you can think of this. I know it's not a very nice analogy, but like people that are on drugs, right? Yeah. Like their brains attach to the feeling of pleasure, high and pleasure yeah. that like certain drugs bring them such that the crash that they feel afterwards is nothing in comparison, right? Exactly. Like they might hate it, but at the end of the day, if the feeling is what they're trying, like the initial feeling is what they're trying to chase, yeah. that they're willing to go through that. Yeah. And I think it's very similar for a lot of people that become incredibly talented in whatever they do, right? Yeah. Like one example is also, also what is his name? Sohei or Shohei Otani. Um, he's the baseball player that is yeah. with the Dodgers. I think it's the Dodgers. I don't know. Um, but yeah, like he's an incredibly, you know, f- he's a freak of nature when it comes to baseball because he's like, he's able to pitch and um, bat at the same time. Yeah. Like he, he's a super well... Um, athlete and you know comparatively to a lot of other people he's like absolutely insane yeah but he also funnily enough has these like freak mentality where the only thing that's on his mind is training and how how to get better at baseball yeah right so it's like this type of person whose whole life revolves around baseball yeah so it kind of makes sense to put those two together and be like okay he's spending so much time and he has devoted so much time to the sport and his whole life is the sport of yeah. course he would be good at it. Exactly. Right? Like, it's not like he was just born with the abilities to just pitch a baseball. Yeah. Um, or, you know, have a really high accuracy when it comes to, like, hitting balls. Um, so, but yeah, it's, so it's definitely, like, I guess, I guess to a degree, it's like, how do we retrain our brain to enjoy things that we think are painful? Because, like, that's the same thing, right? Like, people go to the gym, they start going to the gym, they don't like going to the gym, but maybe somebody brought them in, or yeah. it, it, there was some greater cost, and then they slowly start falling in love um, with the process I think that, things. Uh, so I thought about this a bit by myself, uh-huh. and uh, I think what I realized is like, okay, so like, 
imagine you're trying to learn chess, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then you play against Grandmaster, he absolutely smokes you. How are you going to feel? Terrible. Exactly. Are you going to like the game? Probably not. Exactly. So who do you play against? Uh, people that are like at your level. Exactly. So you have to have this balance of like challenge, but like not too easy where it's just like meaningless. So yeah. you can progress yourself. You're like, oh, I failed this time, but I succeeded this time. It's like a balance, you know? Yeah. It's like, and you can incrementally go up. Um, and I, I think that's true for like weightlifting too. It's like, if you're kind of so self-critical, you're like, I'm gonna bench 400 pounds, go in, see this really jack guy, and you can barely bench the bar. And you're like, you think I'm shit. <laughs> yeah. And you never go to the gym again. It's like, that's pointless. You, sh you have to be proud of the progress you made by stepping foot into the gym. Mm -hmm. Um, having a plan and then like slowly adding five pounds to the bar every week. Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing, especially when starting out, and I've heard this about people that like ha having to go to the gym for the first time, is just like, you know, the first few times that you're there, don't even honestly, don't even worry about just like lifting anything. Just yeah. get comfortable with the environment. Yeah. Because what you want to do is set up the expectation that like even if I'm not really doing anything, walk for five minutes, like just kind of check out the machines, yeah. almost like if you were shopping around. Uh, just get comfortable with the environment. You don't want to do yeah. too much and strain yourself to the point where, like, you become uncomfortable. You, for a lot of things, especially if you're trying to build habits, one of the most powerful things that you can do is just make them as easy as possible starting out. Yeah. Right? Because you, once something becomes hard, you don't want to do it. Yeah. Like, it's one of the things uh, that is very innate to us. Like, we don't want to expend more precious time and effort than we need to on yeah. anything. Yeah. So making something as easy as possible, like, if you want to start baking... Uh, you know, the, what, what it's something easy that you can like do, like don't even like start baking. Maybe just look at ingredients. Yeah. Like that's it. Just purely look at ingredients, uh, get ideas, but that's it. Don't, don't cook yet. Don't like go up, and trip <laughs> yourself up so yeah, yeah, bad yeah, that yeah. you don't want to get back up. Yeah. The whole thing is like, you want to take very, very tiny baby steps. And celebrate it. Like be proud of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause everybody starts somewhere. Like it's, it's also very misleading to call it, call, to call yourself a beginner. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody was a beginner at one point. Yeah. It's so like beginner being a beginner is not a bad thing. It's a good thing because you recognize that you're learning. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's definitely one of the biggest thing. I've I've been going through it recently with like drawing. Yeah. I've never been good at drawing, but again, it's because I've never really spent any time on it. Yeah. So now there was a, there was a recent video by like PewDiePie, and he did like a drawing. He did two videos. Uh, drawing learning how to draw in 30 days and then it was like a hundred day yeah so he started out really terribly yeah but his whole idea was you know what i'm just i'm just gonna draw i'm just gonna draw for like 10 to 30 minutes every day it doesn't really matter what i draw it's just gonna be something that i enjoy something that's like easy to draw yeah because what you want to do is just get comfortable holding the pen like you just yeah. want to be able yeah. to have a fluidity yeah. to your yeah. to your movements yeah. don't even worry about actually yeah. drawing something nice um, and so he turned out really good at the end of a hundred days. Like a lot of anime, like a lot of people that did art on YouTube were like, oh my God, he like, he, he's actually pretty good now. <laughs> That's insane. Um, yeah. and I've been sort of going through the same thing. Um, even if it takes me longer, even yeah. if it doesn't take me like, you know, 30 days, even if it takes me like 200 days yeah. at the very least, I'm like doing something that is small enough to where I don't have to worry about it. It's something that's also de-stressing at the end of my day. I just pull up something on Pinterest or Instagram from like an art another artist and I'll just try and like recreate it yeah. myself. I'll just put on some music. And it's something that is, again, super easy to get into because I'm not doing it for anyone else. Yeah. I'm not necessarily showing these to anyone. There is no pressure. It's just, oh, this is just something I'm doing to relax before bedtime. Yeah. Almost like reading before bedtime. Yeah. So I do that. Uh, and then you can, I I've been going through like drawings. I think I'm like the 15 or 16th day streak. Yeah. And you can definitely see small improvements, even if it's in, even if it's, even if the, the images are still both pretty bad. Yeah. yeah. Like first day to 17th day. At the very least, I'm spending less time yeah. getting it to that point. Yeah. So what that means is I've been speeding up. Like my abilities have improved even in the fact that I'm able to do the exact same thing, but way faster and with less effort. Yeah. yeah so yeah. even then that's a win, right? Yeah. Similarly, like if you're lifting uh, 20, I don't know, if you're going to the gym and lifting like 20 pound dumbbells and you're like, oh my God, I, I, I've, been, I've been stuck in 20 pound dumbbells for the longest time. But then you look back and say, hey, I started doing like, five reps of 20 i'm doing like 20 reps of 20 now yeah like even if you're doing the exact same way like you've been 
you've been doing a lot of reps. Yeah. Like you've been progressing. So yeah. progress, and even then, progress isn't even linear, right? Yeah. You can have plateaus, and then you can get out of your plateaus. Uh, so I think it's definitely just like honing in the skill of being open to learning, being open to fail, having potentially a community or somebody around you to like keep you very, very focused on what you yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think honestly, that's probably like the biggest recommendation on it. But if we had like a brain chip that was able to like give us these nice feelings, it might be, you know, better. Yeah. Because there is potentially like, especially for like drug addicts, there could be a case to be made about a, a, uh, a brain computer interface that was able to like take away some of the, some of the feel good stuff. F- yeah. Yeah. Some of the some feel good chemicals in the brain when thoughts or impressions of like certain drugs happen in the brain uh, so that you're taking you're disassociating the yeah, brain yeah uh with good feelings and the drug itself so there could be an argument to be made that like was even, that real no, no no i'm just saying like oh, okay. you could theoretically right if you yeah, have the, yeah. the power to affect these things in the brain with a brain computer interface these could even use for rehabilitation of like uh drug addictions yeah right yeah, exactly. and potentially as well the building up of good habits yeah Cause then you can set like, Oh, every time I think about uh, going to the gym, I get a nice little, just like feeling about it. If yeah. I go to the gym, I feel good. Cause that's something that already happens, but the initial thought of it is not, is you, you don't get a good, good, um, good emotions out of it. Potentially. Yeah. We're talking about the human capability, like extent uh-huh. of human capabilities, like physical nature, cognitive <laughs> nature, maybe like emotional, I guess. Um, cognitive nature is more of just like like playing chess like how much stuff you can store in your brain how much stuff you can remember like how fast you can process things like your reading speed mm-hmm. um, and we established that we can train those those things and we don't know like the limit of it as yeah. of currently yeah that's true um, and and we said that basically you're able to like reframe your perspective in a way so that is more positive and more conducive to growth rather than like oh, I'm not good enough or won't be good enough yeah. It's more like, um, I'm making progress, I will reach there. That kind of mindset. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of mindset is, is very, like, like, I guess my question is, how do you develop that mindset? Like, wh- where does the mindset come from? Oh, uh, th- there's definitely, like, a whole bunch of different things that go into mindset. There's, like, life experiences. Yeah. Um, there's, I guess there might be some innateness to it as well. Like, the stuff you, tell, the stuff you and people t- around you tell, tell you? Yeah, because for example, like you're, you know, if you have uh, people that are enabling you and then sort of allow you to make mistakes, yeah, then it's a lot easier to start building habits or to yeah. start building uh, nice connections with differing yeah. amounts of things versus yeah. if you have a, an environment which is very cutthroat, yeah, you don't even want to try because you don't want to mess up, right? And yeah, it's kind of like um, a good example of that is like raids. Yeah. Like you're taking an exam, you don't want to fuck up. So that is conducive to not making mistakes. But in reality, you want to make more mistakes so you can learn from it. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. you want to know your errors. You want to yeah. be able to like account for those. Um, so there's definitely like that environment aspect. Like your family, like again, depends on it. Like if your family is, you know, enabling you to make mistakes and learn yeah. from them, then that's really conducive to you to be yeah. able to handle mistakes later in your future. Yeah. Whereas if your family, again, is very cutthroat or maybe they set very high expectations of you and don't allow you to make mistakes yeah then you're kind of scared to make mistakes even at home which you know theoretically should be like the best place to make mistakes yeah. because you're in a safe environment where realistically there aren't a lot of consequences to yeah. your actions yeah yeah so there's definitely that there again might be the argument that like some people innately just in the their genetic make makeup are more sensible to a couple of things similarly to how some people uh, are more prone to developing like addictions for yeah. drugs and stuff yeah. like that just like the way their anatomy works um and then to some degree it's just again like you were saying it's just training it's just seeing what works um and i think based off your life experiences if you you yours you yourself have allowed yourself to fail uh and seen that like you can get through it and you can get back up then that allows you much more flexibility in saying hey if i you know i've done this before uh, yeah. I know how this is a similar feeling to back then when I couldn't do this. Yeah. Um, so that means that there is light at the end of the tunnel, right? Yeah. So you hold on to the hope that like, hey, I can get better yeah. because I've been in a similar situation before. So I, f- I feel like once you very knowledgeably 
have had that feeling of, oh, I've been not good at something in the past. I have felt like I couldn't get better, but I kept with it and gotten to the other side with better skills. Yeah. Then I can do it again. Yeah. Right. So once you have that first experience, you can just kind of go off and keep doing it and keep doing it. Yeah. So it's it's definitely like a combination of all these three things. So if you're not like if you haven't necessarily had any of these experiences, it's definitely hard because you have no context, right? We're, we're very scared of the unknown. We're very scared of like not knowing what will happen next. Yeah. So, and especially if we don't have a point of reference. Yeah. Um, so I think if you're in like a situation similar to that, I think my best advice would be to like seek out either like a group of friends or somebody that like will give you the confidence to mess up and not feel bad about it. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, just like having and taking the risk of, hey, even if I don't like it, you know, we can we can do something about it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, I have no idea why it's why it's doing that, but whatever. Okay, even if we don't have video, we still have the audio recording. So let's just we'll, we'll just finish off with just like regular talking. Okay, sure. Um, yeah. So I think I want to connect this to AI. Um, so let's say that you are living in a world with the perfect AI, like as I like we described earlier. Uh huh. Um, that was a- that's able to understand like your potential, your full potential, and steps you, you could take to reach that. Yeah. Um, what would it be doing? It would be doing, like, it would first, let's say it doesn't change who you are. So, like, you're still human. Uh-huh. Like, the, like, like literally just, like, who you are right you now. You still have, like, autonomy over yourself. Yeah, still have autonomy over yourself. Um, it would probably, But that's just like saying, what would God do? Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, it is. It, it is. That's why it's, it's like a pretty, pretty weird question to ask because like, you know, in the face of something that is like able to do whatever uh, and it has the best intentions, then there's really like no reason to have any objections. Yeah. Reasonably, right? Yeah, like yeah. Reasonably, there wouldn't be any objections. Yeah. But then we like, if we step back and try and like put it in reality, uh, less than of God, but more so like a product that yeah. somebody's trying to pitch maybe yeah. it has a little bit more merit in trying to get at some of these ideas yeah. so maybe maybe don't uh put it in the in the context of like a god maybe put it in the context of hey a company came up with this idea because then that allows a little bit more flexibility and like deconstructing the idea i see because right? yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it might have more faults yeah 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 um Yeah, I mean, I guess so. One thing I guess I was thinking about was, like, the potential for human growth, mm-hmm. and like, I'm not sure. Like, um, like, do we even have free will? <laughs> uh, I don't. I, that's I, I don't know about that question. Uh. <laughs> Uh, if anything, maybe we have the illusion of free will. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think. Okay. So, okay. My opinion on this is I think we do have free will. Okay. Because we're able to say no. We're able to say yes when things tell us to say no. Okay. So we can choose for ourselves, even though other people tell us not to, or other okay. situations tell us not to. Interesting. But like the difference between that and like infinite free will I don't know if that's the right description. It's like, we don't always have that capability. It's like, sometimes we just go to bed, we, we scroll on Instagram. We don't, we're not like, we're like, it's like a con- unconscious thing that we just like flow into. Yeah. Like fall into. And also another thing is like, if we do really have free will, couldn't we just like push ourselves to go to the gym every day? I think everybody, yeah. No, I think everybody can push themselves to go to the gym. But I feel like, so I, I feel like. Like it's not as strong as we think probably. Yeah. But I, I think, I think that has to do, or in my head, it's sort of like this, you can think of like our subconscious or, or our, I guess, more instinctual habits as this sort of like overprotecting mother, right? Mother yeah. figure. Yeah. Because, you know, to some degree, like these, these, uh these behaviors like help us and keep us alive. Yeah. Right. Like th- this has been the basis for humanity to be able to survive for many thousands of years. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, 
and and like a protective mother like uh, she'll make sure that like she's um making sure that her child or children are safe yeah but the bad thing of that is that like an overprotective mother these sort of behaviors and these sort of uh instinctual things that we have we have just innate to ourselves can potentially hold back the power of our conscious mind that doesn't necessarily mean that the conscious mind can't necessarily overcome some of the behavioral instincts that yeah we do yeah have. i know what you mean um but it's more so like it's harder right it's yeah. sort of like again like an overprotective mother trying to not get her like children to leave home yeah that doesn't necessarily mean that like the children can't leave home yeah but it's definitely like harder to try and do that when the mom is like doing a lot of things that will yeah. discourage this decision yeah so that's like the mental analogy that i kind of came up with is like you can still overpower your behavioral subconscious because people do it right yeah we, we we've seen people like david Go david goggins or you know just go and talking about like somebody in your life that has had to overcome like adversity in some way or form them not wanting to even start has been that subconscious that's telling them hey don't you know don't do this because it can potentially be dangerous or yeah you know there's this thing but you know at, at the end of the day your consciousness has been strong enough to overpower it so and again i feel like it's a training exercise like you have to train your consciousness to be able to deal with and overcome the power of the subconscious to a degree like you have to have that mental strength over time to be able to get away from these instinctual habits that you you do have right because theoretically you can go to bed without scrolling on instagram yeah but it is at at the, at, at the start it is going to take some some very harsh decision and it's got you, you're gonna feel it like you're gonna know that you're making the mental yeah, decision to not do something my my this my question like i'm very curious mm -hmm. as to why we default to that is there like a brain or like neuroscience reasons for it for defaulting to like the innate it's, behaviors yeah i feel like again it's just like processing power it's just like easy right like we don't uh -huh. something that we don't have to think about because like it's been proven, or this is this is my assumption. Again, I'm not like neuro. I'm I'm computer science, but uh, my my assumption to this would be that it takes time and it takes calories and it takes energy to think consciously, right? Yeah. Like we've we've seen this before, where I believe it is like your brain uses like whenever you're doing something mentally taxing, mentally challenging. Yeah. Like your body just needs sugar, mm -hmm. right? To process. Oh, things. I think I think I got something. I realized something. Yeah. Um. So basically, so what you're saying is we run on the system mm -hmm. where a lot of it is driven by the premise to just like survive. Yeah. And because of that, the next step would be to like um, maximize like survival rate. So like not using excess energy when possible. Yeah. So just like being able to sustain the basic needs. But we've advanced civilization so much that we want to achieve goals that are beyond that. Yeah, exactly. So, and, so like we have to really like push ourselves to expend energy when our body doesn't want us to expend energy to like work on like this really complicated math problem or like to lift weights when we don't really want to. And it's like this, the system is different. And like, if we are able to recreate the human like brain or like structure to mm -hmm. allow us to like consciously design our day to without, without the basic premise of surviving yeah, or without the basic premise of like, not expending energy where it's inefficient. So like we can like like turn on turn it on when yeah, we yeah. want to. It's like turn off when we want to. And yeah. not just like be subject to like, you know, what it whatever exactly. it is right now. And that would be really powerful. Yeah. Because like you were saying, like it's one of these things that in a way has held us back for so long. Uh like before, you know, this this I feel like this behavioral way of thinking came about from just natural evolution, right? This yeah. is what's been keeping us alive. But our environment has changed so much that yeah. the way in the evolution of our brain hasn't necessarily kept up with it yeah so in that way of like changing your mind to be able to do something else it rather than like the environment environment adapting to you as a person yeah it's more so that you're adapting to this new reality to this new way of living yeah exactly that our ancestors necessarily didn't necessarily have i think that's why i think it's beneficial to have a world where we merge with computers yeah because the computers like you you run a computer and you make it run like um, a crazy program or run it even if it's like it doesn't complain it doesn't complain yeah yeah uh, it'll just do the job like whatever 
the, whatever you define success is, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll, it'll try to achieve that like parameter no matter what. Right. And it'll only fail if like the program itself is flawed or there are like some external circumstances it can't control. Right. Uh, but then you can program it and it's like it's doesn't it's not like suicidal or in a way. It's like oh, okay, so okay. it's like it wasn't it wouldn't like run for infinitely. Like if it realizes at a certain point this infinite long loop will go back and fix itself. Yeah, exactly. So it's like it's it's aware of itself, but it's like a computer. Mm -hmm. Um I think that'll be really interesting. Yeah, and honestly I feel like in that way, like you're kind of pairing like the two biggest pros of yeah. like the brain and a computer because at that point like you're able to give yourself the ability to go past these limiting factors that are innately built on you but at the same time still have the mental capacity to feel and to you know take a more nuanced approach to things yeah like you can still do the hard stuff but you're also giving yourself the option or the availability to do things that you want to do yeah. rather than just what a computer is telling you to do. Yeah. You're just saying, hey, I really want to do this. So because I really want to do this, unlock um, the limiter that I have on the progress that I'm able to make. Yeah. That yeah. will naturally otherwise would have come up. So I think, yeah. honestly, I feel like that's a really good note to end it. Um, you know, we've talked about a bunch of things, but I feel like there is definitely like this sweet spot between brain computer interfaces a potential algorithm or some type of technology that is able to merge with the brain yeah such that we are still able to keep our humanity we're still able to feel and to you know appreciate art and do a lot of these things yeah. but at the same time go and break beyond our just very natural and animalistic behaviors that we've kind of been dealing with for so long yeah in this new reality that you know we don't necessarily need that anymore. Yeah, that's not to like say animalistic behavior is like terrible. Like animals, like no, we, they we kept, kept us like, alive. It kept like, us alive. Like, that's why we're so here. It's good. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But it's definitely something that like has to change even a little bit in yeah. this new reality where, you know, we we still need to survive. Like even in this world out here, like there there are still needs for that. But at the same time, when we feel like we don't necessarily need those holdbacks or those chains tying yeah. us down, we are able to just like temporarily take them off to be able to reach new levels and new potentials yeah also like um like part of the animalistic thing is like we require food and water to sustain ourselves yeah like if we get rid of it we'll just be running on like electricity yeah kind of i mean it's not to say it's bad but it's just like interesting thing to think about yeah yeah and then that and that's one of the things right like uh but I then like, you kind of want to preserve like the art of just like eating good food i don't know like, exactly yeah no but that's the thing right like you could potentially have like limiters if you have like this chip you could program it to have limiters like oh once uh you know i want to keep on drawing right i just want to keep practice drawing oh but you know make sure that like if i need to eat something to stop the drive to to draw and increase the drive to go eat kind of thing right because that'll happen like some people that are on like adh medication yeah they'll completely like forgo their appetite oh and they'll like stop eating for like long periods of time so they kind of have to mentally go and eat oh i see so you can you can technically like have some built-in like you know if uh hunger is getting to this level just like disregard drawing for now yeah and then you know go and increase the the need for eating yeah. So so there, there 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 are still like some ways that you can go ahead and like preserve some of the more animalistic behaviors. It doesn't mean like we don't need them, but making sure that we are more in sync with them and in a better balance with them uh, than otherwise. But you want to control it. Yeah, you want to be able to sort of like dial in. Yeah. Yeah. How much of these animal animalistic behaviors you really want in like yeah. a certain task. I think this. I think I have a really philosophical question. Okay. And it's, like, why not just exist for the sake of existing the way we are right now? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like there's, not necessarily, like, with me, but I feel like in the greater scheme of things, I feel like sometimes there is this dissatisfaction with, like, not knowing where your life can lead up to. Uh -huh. And I feel like maybe that's what is driving a lot of people to do the things they do yeah is because they want to see how far they are able to reach up and down so maybe so maybe it's more of a it's more of a i don't know where this road ends so i want to keep going until i find an end 
not necessarily. Are you saying it's, it's like human nature to try to find it, to try to get more? I feel like it is, cause, cause there, there's another. Is that word. animalistic? <laughs> in a way, yeah, you could even say that in a way, right? Like, no, no, no but you're completely true, right? Like yeah. the whole the whole idea of like greed, yeah, and a lot of these things. I think it does. It's like you gotta get more territory so you can have a higher chance of survival. Exactly. Expand your group. You know? So I, I really do, do feel like it's in a way like an animalistic behavior, right? Yeah. Like greed and a lot of these other things. Uh, gluttony, for example, like oh, I gotta eat right now because I have food. Otherwise, I don't. Like, have I gotta food eat all of it right now because I don't know where I'm gonna like my next meal gonna come. You know. Exactly. So yeah. So even then, right? Like maybe you know, dialing in these animalistic behaviors may even lead up to, like, a greater or better society where, you know, people aren't necessarily just driven by pure greed um, yeah. and maybe are able to think a little bit more logically. Because a lot of the times, right, like, this type of greed yeah. isn't necessarily very logical for, like, the greater yeah, it's like betterment of the world. One question I would say is, like, say we reach these states, okay, like, like 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, like a million years from now, I don't know. Uh-huh. But say we reach that state. Do you want us to expand to other solar systems and conquer the galaxy, colonize the galaxy? I mean, I wouldn't mind it. Uh, Is that animalistic? Mm, okay, like what if we turn it all off and say we just live on our own home planet and just like chill? We could do that. And if an asteroid comes, we move. Like if it explodes, we move. That could be a possibility. Yeah. I think. I think the main thing is like, I don't know how much of it is like, animalistic right if you were able to say oh this is animalistic then maybe we could go but i feel like we don't exactly know if our reach for expansion is animalistic or if it's based off of knowledge like if we we want to learn more therefore we go and search out these things or we want to have a higher survival rate so we go out and search these things I feel like that's where, like, I'm not exactly sure which one of those. But, okay, but, is. like, what if, um, I think it's a survival rate. Because, like, if you know more, you'll survive better. Interesting. It uh, might play into the two as well. Yeah. But, okay, so, like, say you're on a home planet. You know for sure, because you have very good computing power. Okay. That you're going to survive for the next, like, billion years. Yeah. And if you know, like, if it explodes, you just move to the next one. And you're able to do that. And you, like, identify, like, a uh, hundred possibilities where you could do that. So, like, survival rate is near 100%. Okay. So you've already achieved that goal. Yeah. And because you don't have like the animalistic behavior to, you know, conquer other stuff, you just exist where you are and be peaceful. Maybe that's the answer to the Fermi paradox. Perhaps. Yeah. That could be entirely true, actually. Yeah. Because then at that point, like, there is no need for something else. I guess it's in that way you just have, like, even if it's for the next 100 or maybe 1,000 years, like, you do have this perfect piece of paradise where you can just, like, chill. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. And I think... You know, we can kind of post the same question to, like, our viewers. Yeah. You know, if anybody's watching or anybody's listening to it, like, think about that. Like, would do you think that we would be able to chill on the Earth for the next 100 or 1,000 years if we were able to? Um, and is that potentially, like, the answer to Burmese par- paradox? So, yeah, I think yeah. that's it for, for this episode. Uh, definitely a great conversation algorithms. We kind of went a little bit more philosophical in that sense, but I don't necessarily think that's a... That's a bad thing. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So, thank you guys for watching, and hopefully you see us in the next episode of the Futurism at J2 podcast. All right. All right. Thank, thank you so you. much, Terry, for coming and talking. Yeah, no problem. All right. See you guys. See you.